thanks for joining us for another one of Grace's Facebook Live events today. We're really excited to have you here joining us, and we're also very excited to have uh, Laura Teen from the Julie Valentine Center uh, here to help us understand better the impact that trauma has on our emotional health and our mental health. Uh, Laura is uh, a therapist at the center and does incredible work uh, with uh, kids who have experienced trauma. And uh, I'll let Laura introduce herself in just a little bit. A couple of things that I want to introduce here as we get going. Please be aware that it's quite likely that at some point during our conversation today, we will be talking about particularly heavy topics like child abuse. Uh, so please make sure that you're taking care of yourself during the conversation. And that might mean doing some self-regulation stuff like breathing, deep breathing, prayer, uh, meditation, sitting up straight with your feet flat on the ground, holding a pillow as you listen to the conversation. So a variety of things that can really help. But also know that it is absolutely okay if the conversation is getting heavy to step aside and to take a little bit of a break. The conversation is going to be recorded. So anything that you'd miss, you can just get later. Um, so please make sure that you're taking care of yourself during the conversation. I also want to mention, especially since we're talking about uh, issues related to mental health and therapy, that we're not giving uh, advice on any specific situation. Uh, so please, if the conversation raises questions for you, please make sure that you're connecting, if you already see a therapist, with the therapist that you already see, or if you're not seeing a therapist already. Uh, Laura and I were talking earlier and we just agreed, everyone should see a therapist. Um, so uh, please uh, make sure to uh, use those resources that are out there. Um, my name is Pete. I'm the executive director of GRACE. Uh, and with GRACE, we do a lot of work with uh, Christian faith communities on recognizing, preventing, and responding to abuse. Our main focus uh, is typically child abuse, but we also address many other forms of abuse, spiritual abuse, abuse of power, harassment. Um, so really any form of abuse that intersects within Christian faith communities is where we like to uh, put our focus. We do work with prevention, training, policy review, consultation, and also with accountability through assessments and investigations. We're honored to have Laura on our board um, and also really just the experience and expertise that she brings through her work. Uh, Laura, do you wanna give a little bit of your background and then we'll jump into the conversation. Sure, thank you, Pete, for having me today. I'm really excited for our conversation and absolutely agree with everything you mentioned related to self-care for folks who are listening in. Um, and considering you know, what support you might need as well for yourself and the people um, around you. Um, I, my background um, is primarily in the work of trauma. So I started out in um, working with adoptions, um, have both been in some clinical practice, um, and then again with um, families and children who are in foster care, and then have transitioned within the last several years to solely focusing on working with adults who have experienced sexual trauma, men and women, both in an individual and a group setting um, at the Julie Valentine Center. Um, and the Julie Valentine Center um, is here in Greenville, South Carolina, and we are the Rape Crisis and Child Advocacy Center for our local area. So we serve both children um, and adults, and we know that children who have experienced trauma grow up to be adults with a history of trauma. And so well, we are able to help wherever you're at on the spectrum um, of your lifespan with that. And we're really um, pleased and honored to be able to come along those who have experienced trauma and be a part of their healing work. So thank you so much for having me. Great, well, thank you, Laura. We are definitely uh, looking forward to benefiting from your, your great expertise in this area. So really, um, one of the things that we wanna talk about right from the get-go as we look at this is a lot of times uh, when people have had significant uh, traumatic events in their life, whether it's uh, child abuse or some other form of abuse or other form of trauma, it can 
impact how they respond to or how they perceive threats. And that kind of lays the foundation for a lot of stuff around self-regulation and around mental health. Can you maybe give us just a little insight on what is a typical response to threat or danger and how that might be impacted if a person has a history with trauma? Sure. So two core needs that every human being has are um, safety and connection. And when we think about trauma, when we think about the impact of trauma on the brain and on the body, a lot of the time what we're seeing, what we're experiencing is that um, our body and brain are seeking out safety, right? Um, the response that is built into our body that God has designed our body <laughs> to have in, to a threat um, is meeting that need of, am I safe? How do I find safety in a situation um, where there's a threat, where I don't feel safe? And also, how do I connect? Um, and, and, and is that connection a source of safety? And so I, I kind of wanted to say on the front end as well, that as we're talking about this body-brain um, interaction and response, that in addition to that, it can feel really overwhelming to try to understand and think about the impact of trauma or what we see in the people around us. But if we remember that we're all, we're all on this journey and this process of life seeking out safety and connection constantly, neurobiologically, physiologically, relationally, um, that can kind of help us understand and frame what we're seeing and what we're experiencing for ourselves. And so that's really what we're seeing in the way that our bodies are designed to respond to a threat. We're looking for a way to survive and feel safe. And so the brain, the way that it's designed both to respond um, subconsciously and consciously to our experiences um, has built into it a very specific response to threat. Um, and the different parts of our brain that interact to respond and to make sense of our experiences um, you, you know, are part of different systems of the brain so that we can respond both subconsciously and quickly and automatically and also later come in and try to make sense. So the part of our brain that is really, really interacting with a threat and kind of letting our body know, okay, it's time to survive, it's time to survive, is called the amygdala. And the amygdala is, you don't have to know how to spell it, you don't even probably have to remember to say it, but there is a specific part of our brain that is designed to signal to us what we're experiencing is a threat we need to survive. Um, that part of our brain sends messages to the rest of our body, you know, let's, let's go, let's get ready. Let's either um, get ready to fight and kind of fight back to run away, um, to, to shut down um, and kind of dissociate or freeze. Um, or, and there's also the fawn response that has become kind of a newer um, response that we've been learning about related, related to that survival mode. And so our, our whole body diverts all of its resources from other normal functions to this survival response because that is what is needed in the moment to answer the question, am I safe, right? So our heart rate is going, cortisol is pumping, our nervous system is preparing for us to survive. And so when we see that happen, um, we, I, I, I hope what's helpful in understanding that is that this is a normal process that our brains and bodies are designed to experience. And it's a normal response to an abnormal circumstance, which is that traumatic event. Um, we're supposed to respond this way. Unfortunately, what can happen um, when our bodies and brains are responding to that event or to a, set, a series of chronic events is that we can get stuck in that response. Our brains can learn, this is what I need to do if I perceive a threat, whether the threat is there or not. Um, our nervous systems can kind of develop this learned reaction to memory and to things that are happening right in front of us. So the response that we have to a threat is part body, part brain, um, and it, it involves our whole selves, um, our mind, our emotions, and our physical selves as well. Wow, so that really is all-encompassing. Well, so then you talked about that's really how we're designed, but it can create complications if we get stuck there. What is, is that what makes abuse or trauma different from normal stress or what, what does happen when we get stuck there? Yeah, I mean, really, yes. Essentially, you know, in, in a normal stress response, I know Pete, you work with this as well in, in your work. Um, 
normally when our body is going into that survival mode, we are able to regulate back to a, a state of calm and the cortisol you know, comes down, it's not pumping as hard. Um, our heart rate um, comes back to a normal resting rate. Our bodies return to that state of sort of calm, general functioning. But when we experience trauma, sometimes that response gets stuck on. So we, our bodies and brains cannot return to that normal resting state. And again, if there's a chronic series of events that occurs as well, our, our bodies and brains can kind of remain in this high alert, this on, on switch, if you will, where um, we're experiencing that survival response regularly and not able to return or to return as quickly um, to that state of calm, whether that's you know, the nervous system needs to re-regulate or we need to better understand um, is the threat that's in front of us real or perceived? Is this a flashback in a memory or am I really in danger right now? And there's a lot of work you can do in therapy around that. There are a lot of different practical things that can help different skills we can even talk about related to that to help the brain realize what's, what's actually happening instead of, um, instead of the threat that it perceives is there. So we can get stuck. You know, our brain can be getting the message. Our nervous system can be um, kind of being sent um, into all levels of um, overwhelm, shut down, all of those things. Um, and we really are stuck in that. Um, a lot of survivors talk about feeling broken. And when, and, and that kind of language can sometimes bring a sense of shame. And so a lot of what I like to talk about with survivors when when I meet with them is, I wonder if we can shift that language from I'm broken to I'm just stuck. Sure. And how does that help us reframe our experience? And how does that help us feel empowered that maybe we can be unstuck? You know, wow. what, what, what does that look like? What does that mean? I love that Im imagery. I'm from Minnesota and I have no clue about cars. And if my car is broken, I know that I'm just out of luck because there's nothing I can do. But I'm also from Minnesota. My car gets stuck in the snow all the time. And I know that if my car gets stuck in the snow, either I'll get it out or somebody's going to come along and help me get it out. And so I love that switch from broken to stuck because we can get unstuck. And it acknowledges that our experiences um, are... We're never going to be able to go back to the way things were before. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I just want to go back to the way I was. Maybe when I'm, maybe when I'm done with therapy, I'll feel like my old self. Well, unfortunately, you know, trauma does have an impact on us that cannot be completely reversed. So what does it look like to live life in a healthy way now? What does it look like to live life with a, a better, bigger awareness of how our bodies and brains respond? Can we honor the response that our bodies and brains did have to our experience because it kept us alive? Yeah. Um, what, what does that look like? How, does, how do we feel empowered in that way? And I think that's a really important piece for people to sort of work through is, okay, if I can't go back to the way things were, um, can I create a new ending yeah. instead? Yeah, and that's so powerful. And also what you described as a lot of those things that we point to when we're outside of the trauma seem, wow, what's what's going on here? But you, I think, really hit the nail on the head when you said those are the things that kept us alive. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that helped us survive. Mm -hmm. and to, to realize that that's what looks different when it's out of that context was actually an incredible strength. Yeah. And that reframe is so important. It's a strength, right? We, we look at it as a problem sometimes because we, we don't want to be stuck in it. And um, yeah, it kept me alive, but, <laughs> you know, fill in the blank. Um, but, but it is a strength. And we were, we were given this response as an intended response to what's happening in our environment. Um, and so I think also just knowing this is the way it's supposed to work um, can be helpful in understanding that we don't have to feel shame because it did work. Yeah. Right. Wow. wow. To remove the shame. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's mm -hmm. powerful. So let's say that whether it's us, whether it's someone we know, we're kind of in 
this place where when there might be a threat, we react as though there's for sure a threat. And if there's for sure a threat, we have this big response. Is, is there any way to manage that response? Hmm. Yes, <laughs> there, there, is, uh, there are a lot of different things that we talk about related to coping um, skills and skills that we can develop to sort of kind of talk back to the response in a way. Uh, it, it does involve understanding some of the different parts of the brain and body and, and kind of what's happening in that survival mode, but also what we need from the part of our brain that helps us use logic and reasoning and making bigger sense of our experiences. Um, that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, is um, helping us answer questions like, am I capable? What's next? Mm -hmm. How do I go about this now? Right. But when we are in that heightened survival mode on high alert, that part of the brain can't fully engage with us because again, all those resources are diverted to surviving, right? So that part of the brain isn't as loud as the other part of the brain. So in thinking about ways to um, engage the part of the brain that is engaged in our survival response, a lot of what we understand is that our bodies need to feel calm before our brain can think calmly about mm. what's going on. And so what that can look like is engaging in different exercises to help our body feel safe um, so that we can then think safely. So sometimes that can look like um, engaging with the five senses to remind us that we're in the here and now, yeah. right? What do I see around me? Um, is what just flashed in my mind, the reality of where I am? What can I, what can I touch? What can I smell? What can I hear? What can I taste? What can I pay attention to in my environment that reminds me of where I am? Sometimes um, it can be helpful to even have a little item that you can rub between your fingers. And sometimes um, if you have a little rosary or maybe a keychain with some texture on it, maybe you can, I know Pete, you talk regularly about kind of holding a hot mug of coffee or drinking something that's very cold, kind of reminding your senses, hey, guess what? We're here, we're now we're safe, we're not back then, we're not in that moment anymore. And when your body feels more safe, then your brain can start to re-engage the different parts that it needs to make sense of what's happening, make meaning of what's going on right now. So those grounding experiences is what we call them, um, can be really helpful in beginning the process of emotional regulation or helping the body and brain um, return to that state of calm that it needs. Wow, yeah. I can remember um, uh, nine or 10 years back when uh, I had cancer and I was going through some particularly difficult um, and, and painful treatments. One of the things that I did had a lot of what you were describing. I, I held a, a stress ball and I squeezed the stress ball that feeling of my body squeezing. And as I was doing that, um, I uh, was quoting a scripture, momentary trials, eternal gain, momentary trials, eternal gain, momentary trials, eternal gain. And I talked to my therapist and my therapist said, that's great, but now slow that down. <laughs> and my goodness, just that intentional slowing myself down too is, is exactly what you were saying. I'm engaging with what my body's doing. And instead of saying momentary trials, eternal gain, I'm saying momentary trials. And wow, just the power of engaging with my body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we also underestimate breathing mm. <laughs> because breathing is such a subconscious um, function of the body and how we operate, but really um, there's a lot out there about deep breathing exercises. We talk a lot about that at the Julie Valentine Center when people are in crisis, doing some deep breathing. When people are in a heightened state of emotion, when they're in panic or overwhelm, even anger, um, breath work can be really helpful. That engages um, a different part of the nervous system um, and kind of fuels the body, but also you can incorporate scripture and prayer, um, breath prayers, there are a lot of um, exercises out there. You can do some guided breath prayer, which can be really helpful to incorporate 
um, or if, you, if you're even of not a Christian faith, but of a faith that has a different sacred text, you can also incorporate um, anything that signals that safety, that calm, that connection to your spiritual belief with breath work. Um, it can be really helpful. Um, and it, if, I mean, at its basic level, it's just fundamentally helping um, your body regulate um, the nervous system um, engaging with that in a way that seems just kind of basic, but really um, it can it can do a lot to bring that body back to a calm state. Yeah. When I when when I've talked with clients about breath work and deep breathing, a lot of them think that they've got the picture of exactly what that means. And then when they ask them to show me, mm-hmm. I realize that it's we're thinking differently. Would you feel comfortable just either demonstrating or talking through a couple of those breathing techniques in a little bit more detail? Sure. Yeah. Um, when we think about deep breathing, well, first of all, it might be helpful for any anyone watching to maybe just take a second and think about, um, do I pay attention to my breathing at all? Because a lot of us don't. Right. I mean, I, I don't go throughout my day thinking about, okay, how am I breathing right now? How am I breathing right now? Unless I know, okay, I really need to focus on this. Uh, it, so again, sometimes it, it's just not that thing we're paying attention to a lot of the time. So the first, the first thing is to, p- to pay attention to how you do breathe. Am I breathing in a very shallow manner up here, right? Is my breath coming from kind of the upper chest and is it short breathing, right? So sometimes when people are panicking, you can almost hear that. <laughs> like that kind of sense of that short breath up here. And it's, it almost sounds more like they're gasping um, for air. And in some ways that's a metaphor, right? For what actually is happening in a moment of panic. But um, a lot of people think that 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 breath work really comes from up here in your chest. But what we're doing with deep breathing is we're engaging the abdomen um, and really pulling breath down as deep as it can go and then pushing it back out again and letting that um, breath circulate through um, and slowing the heart rate down as you're breathing, um, helping that body return to a state of calm. So if I'm doing that, you know, when I'm breathing in, I'm not trying to fill, um, I'm not trying to kind of suck air out of my chest. I'm trying to actually fill my abdomen with air. And one thing you can do to monitor that is to sort of, I know you can't see my whole abdomen, but if I place my, if I place my hand kind of, uh, um, right about my rib cage, if you will, right above my belly button. And I, and I take a, a deep breath in, Do, is my hand rising with that breath or is it sucking in? If it's sucking in, that's not the goal. What we wanna do is take a deep breath in and see our hand rise with our abdomen, like you're filling up a balloon. So we're breathing in, we're filling up our abdomen like a balloon. And then with different deep breath work exercises, you can start to lengthen the toleration of how long you can hold that breath. We can breathe in for three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, you know, as long. Again, let's not, let's not get carried away and not be able to, <laughs> or knock, us, knock ourselves out of consciousness with breathing. But we do want to see if we can tolerate longer inhales and exhales as we go as well. So we want to breathe in. We want to fill the abdomen. We want to be able to see our hand kind of rise as we're filling that abdomen with breath. We're wanting to hold that for a few seconds. And then we're wanting to push that breath out, but do that over the course of seconds over time. So there are different, different ways. It's kind of hard to see maybe here on Zoom. But if, um, if, if you focus on paying attention to your breathing, when I take a deep breath in, um, is my hand rising with my abdomen or is it kind of sucking in? How do I need to adjust? And then work on breathing in over the course of seconds, holding it for a few seconds and then breathing back out. It can help to sort of even do it like a box. Like maybe I can breathe in for six seconds, hold for six, exhale for six, rest for six. Um, and just kind of see if you can play around with the amount of time it takes to do that a little bit. But even just the focus on that um, can help the brain divert its attention a little bit to what we're doing to help that body regulate for calm. Yeah, and it's once again, connecting the body and the mind, Mm -hmm. connecting the body and the mind rather than having them separate. Wow, yeah, that's huge. Um, So I loved how you described the role of the different parts of the brain. Um, 
I saw a video that breaks it down and uh, can also be something that helps people remember um, what what you described. And also, if you're trying to explain this to kids, this is a good video. Mm. It's kids want to know uh, and talks about a concept called flipping your lid. And so that is a, um, a really good resource that I'd encourage people to check out. Kids want to know flipping your lid. It's a cartoon and it just describes this whole process that you were talking about. And it talks about that need to feel safe, that you have to have the body feel safe mm -hmm. before the brain can get there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, that's a, that's great. I think with kids too, you know, when we're talking about breathing exercises, you can use bubbles, you can, mm -hmm. um, you know, that can be a way for them to actually see their breath come out through a bubble and then float. And there's a lot of different cool things you can do to help kids um, do some deep breathing with that. With, um, with kids, we also call it belly breathing sometimes. We do the hand thing, we actually have, we, you know, they could lie on the ground, um, you know, and put their hand on, on their, their abdomen and, and they can see their hand rise and fall. Um, so there's a lot of different cool things you can do with, with kids. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe grownups like bubbles too, right? Maybe sometimes we need, <laughs> maybe sometimes we need to see our breath leave us and then float away. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Kind of depends on how you engage with different things, but um, bl blowing bubbles is a great way also to really focus that breath work as well. Yeah. I tell you, my wife knows when I am working with kids that I'm really getting into the deep breathing and the relaxation skills where we're having the, who can blow the biggest bubble contest. My wife knows, and there are multiple times that she has commented to me, you are just much calmer. You must mm -hmm. be working with kids on this right now. You must be working with clients on this right now because you are mm -hmm. so much calmer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah it, it works for all of us. There are also apps that a lot of people can download to do some guided deep breath work. Um, there's one for a kid, I think it's called the Breathing Butterfly. I'll, I'll, Zane, I'll send it to you um, if you want to put it in the comments, but there are, there are, a, couple, um, there are a couple apps people can use. Um, Headspace, I think is also another really popular one. I, can, I should say, I do not have any official endorsement here. <laughs> I'm simply noting what people have relayed to me as helpful, so please don't, um, Please don't consider this as an official endorsement, but um, there are just different apps out there that can help with breathing and mindfulness um, that even can remind you of grounding skills. So if you have a hard time, maybe even remembering, let me incorporate some of this actively into my life. Having an app that can give you notifications might be a way to signal to your brain, oh, let's take a minute and notice our breathing and just do some of this today. Yeah, I had a client that after about two months uh, after he downloaded Headspace, we started talking about ending therapy because headspace was so powerful in, in his life. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. Those apps can be helpful. So we don't have time for too many more questions, but this is one that I think that's really important um, to ask because a lot of times when we've experienced trauma, like we've been talking about, it becomes very difficult to regulate emotions. Mm. And if that's where I'm at, am I sinning when I have a hard time managing my emotions? Mm. Any thoughts on that one? Well, what I do find in general is that, you know, in different corners, of Christianity, there can be some really unhelpful theology about the role of emotions. And emotions, even instincts that our bodies are designed to have, or these subconscious instinctual responses, those can often be downplayed for thinking the right thing and believing the right thing, right? And we do want to think well, and we do want to believe certain things, especially within specific contexts of, of faith, but again, the body has to feel calm before the brain can think calmly. And so if we translate that into how does that, how does, how does the way that God designed our bodies relate to what we believe about sin and about um, our relationship to God and, and how that looks. And I think acknowledging how we're designed and the, 
and understanding more about the roles of the brain and the nervous system and, and how we can regulate um, can help us understand that emotions are neither bad nor good. They're just information about our experiences. And so the emotion itself is not the issue. It's sometimes it's the behavior that follows, right? We definitely don't want to excuse any harmful behavior that happens because of an emotion. But also um, having the compassion to ask questions about, I wonder why this person um, hmm. is having this experience or wh why are they experiencing me that way? <laughs> why, you know, I wonder why they're responding um, with anger to this situation and being to kind of taking that posture of curiosity and learning more about the person and what they're experiencing versus saying you're dysregulated, um, that's a spiritual problem. Yeah. It's a sin problem. Because really what that's gonna do is shut down possible safety and connection with that person, right? And it's also going to potentially create in that person an, an increased sense of shame, mm -hmm. right? I'm experiencing this response that I don't feel like I can control because it is subconscious, it's dysregulation, and I don't have control over that consciously. So I, there's nothing I can do to be right with God. There's nothing I can do to be right with the people around me. And it really, I think, sets us up for a lot of disconnection from ourselves yeah. and others and sets us up to feel a lot of shame and to really... Um, even feel disconnected from God as a result. Wow. And we know from the conversation that we had with Victor that the sense of connection with God can often be a source of healing. Yeah. And now what you've just done is you've connected that and you've really demonstrated how the spiritual wounds that we talked about last week with Victor are just so intimately connected with the emotional and psychological wounds that we've been focusing on today and how easy it is to even compound that with a theology that says your natural response to trauma is sin and even further separates you from God. Mm -hmm. And it, it in of itself is its own spiritual and emotional wound. Yeah. Right whether that message is given explicitly or implicitly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, wow. and, you know, be, because we're all connect, right. We're our whole selves are connected, interconnected. Right. So what, what Victor said last time, what we're saying today is going to connect further conversations about relationships and behaviors and the physical impact, because we're all interconnected, multifaceted beings. And we were created that way for a reason. Yeah. Right. Wow. Talk about ending on a deep note. Wow. Um, would you, as we connected it to the spiritual side of things, what advice would you give to a church that's trying to help somebody along this path? If we refer back to those basic human needs of safety and connection, sometimes people can feel overwhelmed when they're supporting someone who's been through trauma to think about, am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? What if I mess this up? I mean, that's a real fear people have, right? What if I don't say the right thing and they don't wanna come here anymore or talk to me? And so it, it can also feel overwhelming to consider how can I best support someone? If we refer back to the idea that we're seeking out safety and connection, kind of framing what we do in categories there, right? Is what I'm doing promoting physical, <laughs> emotional, spiritual safety is what I'm doing, promoting healthy connection with this person. Um, if we can kind of couch a lot of what we're doing in those terms, and then maybe we can even think even more practically than that, I think that's a good starting point, right? What will be safe for this person? What will help them connect to themselves? What will help them connect to others, um, the world around them, and, and God? What, what will be helpful for them to do that? Or what will create disconnection instead, right? Um, if keeping in mind that if an unprocessed trauma is present, that a person's environment can feel like a constant attack, 
yeah. if, especially if that person experienced trauma in a religious setting, right? So be aware that if you see someone who come, it does come regularly to a worship service, but appears very dysregulated and responds some have a lot of anxiety or anger, it might be that that environment is difficult for them for a reason, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so be thinking about how a person on high alert flooded with cortisol every time they come to church might respond to that environment and, and what that can look like and have compassion for that. And maybe think about, is there a way for us to help them feel physically safe? Because they won't be able to think calmly until they feel calm, right? Um, rhythms of liturgy can be very stabilizing, <laughs> very calming for people that stability, that um, predictability signals safety to the brain. Right. So in some ways, again, I know that sometimes liturgical practices can be very triggering, but on the opposite end of the coin as well, it can be a way for people to connect um, in a way that signals that safety and predictability for them. If I know that when I go to the service here, the, the core components, we're going to do this and then we're going to do this, we're going to do this and I can connect to that. And even the church liturgical count, like the church calendar of the rhythms of Advent and Lent and all of those things. I know what's coming. I know what's coming. I know what it's going to be. I know that isn't something maybe we even think about, but sometimes things like that can be really helpful for um, a survivor of trauma is like, what, what's about to happen next? I need to feel safe. What's about to happen? Oh, I know what's about to happen. We're about to have the prayer of blessing. We're about to, um, we're about to have communion. We're about to do this other thing. So even, even things related to the order of worship or the liturgy of your specific Christian community can be really helpful for a survivor. Yeah, that's powerful, especially during this time of, you know, heading through the Easter season, um, when even churches that don't often focus on liturgical practices are getting maybe a little bit more liturgical as we head to this time. Mm -hmm. So, I would, I would also say that sometimes when we see behaviors, from people, um, and this is this is a little bit of a reframe. I'm going to set this up as a reframe. Okay, so sometimes we we have learned to think about behaviors we see from people as attention seeking. You know, someone who might um, behave in a way that draws attention to themselves or is really dysregulated. Um, I like to reframe that as connection seeking, mm -hmm. safety and connection seeking behaviors. You know, we we learn as children from early ages from our caregivers. Am I safe? Am I connected? And the answer to that impacts the way that we go about trying to seek that out over time in healthy and unhealthy ways, right? And so when we grow up and we become adults, sometimes we're still seeking out that safety and connection through learned behaviors to get that. And, and sometimes those behaviors may not seem appropriate. They may not seem like you can understand them, but I wonder if we can take a posture of is the behaviors I'm seeing from this person are the emotions I'm seeing from this person actually this person's attempt at adapting mm -hmm. an attempt at seeking that safety, seeking that connection they need. And if I can look at it that way, I wonder how much compassion um, I can have and I can encourage them in for themselves and, and how can I come alongside of them and help them feel safe, right? instead of this is a person that gets on my nerves <laughs> or this is a person I don't understand. Um, if, if we don't understand something, let's try to understand. Let's see where, where that's coming from. How can we show them the compassion of Christ? The ever eternal patient being, right? <laughs> who who yeah. can respond to any number of dysregulated um, people um, who can respond to survivors of, of a variety of traumas with such compassion um, and love instead of disconnection and shame. Yeah. He's not going to be overwhelmed by our emotions. No. Can absolutely hold them. I mean, look at the Psalms. Mm -hmm. They're filled with dysregulation. Yes. Be angry. Be sad. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for uh, just kind of sharing your wisdom, for sharing your knowledge on this. A couple of resources that I would encourage people to um, look into. I mentioned that video before. Other 
resources that Zane can uh, put in the chat. There's one on trauma and brain development, uh, how that impacts a child that gives a lot of information uh, that relates to what Laura was saying. Uh, another one called supporting brain development that also relates to what Laura was saying and also gives some tips for, for parents um, to help strengthen that development in their children. Um, and then also one called enhancing and practicing executive functioning skills uh, from Harvard Center for the Developing Child. For those uh, faith community leaders that might be out there, uh, one that I didn't send to Zane, so he won't put in the chat now, but <laughs> that we can put in later, um, is an article from Currents in Theology and Mission that talks about collaboration between pastoral care and mental health care. Because mm. um, it's important to remember that we have a role and um, a mental health person is probably not going to be able to provide the pastoral care that is necessary, but a pastor is going to need help to provide the mental health care that is necessary. So how do we work together in doing mm. that? Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll have that, not right now because I didn't send it to Zane, but mm -hmm. we'll be coming uh, in, as, a, as a link for you to access as well. I think it's important also real quick, Pete, to remember that like you're talking about that collaboration right between the communities, which is so necessary. And at the same time, knowing that as a faith leader, the person in front of you, if they've experienced trauma, let's refer them to yeah. a trauma um, informed professional, mental health professional, a trained therapist who can help them with that. Um, and as therapists, we need to know when we need to connect them with a member of their faith community to help answer yep. some of those questions that we can't pull in as, as well or as readily, right? And so I think it's important for us to collaborate and also just to remember, um, we don't have to be afraid of the other, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely true. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, and I hope that we'll see you in April. In April, we're really excited We'll be talking, uh, continuing our series on how trauma impacts us. And then that series will be followed up by a series on what can we do about it? How do we prevent? How do we uh, respond right now? And how do we address accountability? So next month in April, we'll be having Lisa Welter from the Catalosa, Catalosso Group joining us. And she does a lot with relationships within families and outside of families as well. She'll be able to talk to us some about uh, restoration and circles, but also understanding boundaries within that. And so being able to recognize when it's a good time to work on restoration and when it's maybe a good time to keep that boundary there um, for safety's sake. And she'll be talking with us about just in general, how trauma might impact a person's relationships. So we hope to be able to see you all in April when we have that discussion. As a heads up in April, we'll be transitioning to Thursday evenings instead of Saturdays. I've heard that sometimes people like doing stuff on the weekend during the spring and summer. So we'll be making that transition to Thursday evenings, uh, but they'll still be recorded so you'll be able to access them at, at any time. Thank you again for joining us and for all of the work and the passion and just the concern that you have around protecting kids. Have a great rest of your weekend.